So Stephanie Buden is your Northern Hemisphere hostess, well, as I'm the Southern Hemisphere one, and she's the author of several books, including The Myth of Sacred Prostitution in Antiquity, Free Women, Patriarchal Authority and the Accusation of Prostitution, and soon to be released, Gender in the Ancient Near East. And Stephanie is the final keynote uh, speaker of this conference, and her talk is called The Fads That Drive Us, From Fraser, Freud and Foucault to Butler and Connell. Thank you, Stephanie. And unmute yourself. There we go. Okay, can everyone see what I see? I hope. Yes. All right. I can. Okay, let's go then. In his in his 1979 small masterpiece, Gaia, James Lovelock opined that, quote, it is somewhat cynically said that the eminence of a scientist is measured by the length of time that he holds up progress in his field. Obviously, this work is a bit dated and narrowly focused. The eminence of any scholar in any field can be measured by how long he or she holds up progress in that field. This potentially cynical fact might be complemented by another. Scholars in the humanities, I can't really speak to the sciences, love fads. They're not seen as fads, of course. They might be recognized as trends. They're acknowledged as new theories and insights into the workings of the universe. They're the source of the buzzwords, which academics use to ornament their papers and books. They evolve into what might be called received wisdom, accepted at face value, and they become the bedrocks of future research and publication. Whether or not they are true is irrelevant. Any idea sufficiently trendy becomes fact. So, okay, maybe I'm a little bitter. One of the impetus for this conference came a while back when I found myself reading yet another article claiming that Near Eastern female figurines were fertility charms based on the fact that they were female. That was followed by another followed by a few lectures on the study of ancient gender, noting that so-called women's religion was oriented around fertility and childbirth, which was obvious in the fact that women used fertility charms, that is, female figurines, in the religious praxis. Op-eds to Harrods and Biblical Archaeology Review did little to ameliorate the situation. I found myself screaming quite a bit, usually something to the tune of, why do we still think this way? Haven't we gotten past the theories of Frazier yet? We all agree that his work is dated and wrong, and then we turn right around and we agree with everything he says and interpret everything with breasts according to the freaking golden bow. And the next thing you know, we're having this conference. But it isn't just Frazier and his golden bow. I scream this way about a lot of theorists and their theories. The not really theories, but hypotheses that we accept as true, as fact, and the bases of our interpretations of reality. In this presentation, I look at some theorists who I, whose hypotheses have been accepted as true, even if we no longer admit it, whose work is now trendy, and how uncritical acceptance of these hypotheses has affected, specifically for my case studies here, gender studies in the fields of ancient Near Eastern research. These are Fraser, Sigmund Freud, Michel Foucault, and Judith Butler, with a final glance at Raywin Connell. So, yep, golden bow. So to begin, James, George, Fraser, and fertility. Now, Fraser was a classicist who, admirably, tried to incorporate the nascent fields of anthropology and Assyriology into his construction of the ancient world. We cannot fault him for the fact that these fields were, in fact, nascent, and that they were only there was only there were only minimal data at the time he was composing his golden bow. We also cannot fault him for viewing the Near Eastern materials through a lens of the Greco-Roman materials. It is natural to proceed from the known to the unknown, especially when the unknown is so unknown. In this, he was not far off from those who interpreted Assyria through a biblical lens. 
And we cannot necessarily fault him for being caught up in the earth moon fertility mother goddess paradigm popularized by the romantic poets and running rampant through the also nascent fields of archeology span as well presented in Ronald Hutton's book, Triumph of the Moon. But I shall fault him for this. And I shall fault all the academics since Fraser who have not been able to see past this wholly limiting view of feminine gender, whereby female equals fertility. I particularly hold Fraser at all accountable because Fraser himself was quite clear that fertility was a masculine attribute in the ancient world, where dying and rising gods such as Thomas and Osiris and self-sacrificing priest kings ensured the growth of the crops. In spite of this, Fraser cast all goddesses into the monolithic category of mother goddess, primarily marked by her associations with fertility, often involving licentious rites, such as sacred prostitution. This construction of the construction of, for example, Mesopotamian Ishtar, Levantine Ashtart, and Cypriot Aphrodite has held on into the present day, even as we openly and publicly eschew the theories of Fraser. Thusly, Fraser created the prototype of the stereotype of all ancient goddesses. Uh, we may conclude that a great mother god, reproductive energies of nature, was worshipped under different names, but with a substantial similarity of myth and ritual by many people of Western Asia. I, I won't force you to listen to me read all of these. Taking the notion of farther east, we read, the sanctuary of Aphrodite at Old Paphos was one of the most celebrated shrines in the ancient world. Uh, it was founded by Phoenician colonists from Ascalon. Uh, it is possible that a native goddess of fertility was worshipped on the spot before the arrival of the Phoenicians. And a bit farther down, if two deities were thus fused in one, we may suppose that they were both varieties of that great goddess of motherhood and fertility, whose worship appears to have been spread all over Western Asia from a very early time. And then finally, speaking of the goddess Ishtar herself, uh, in the religious literature of Babylonia, Tammuz appears as the youthful spouse and lover of Ishtar, the great mother goddess, the embodiment of the reproductive energies of nature. Both Ishtar and Aphrodite are erotic characters. Ashtar actually probably isn't. Furthermore, we have copious data that Ishtar is a martial war goddess. With one possible late exception, once the goddess had already been syncretized with numerous other Near Eastern goddesses, she is never a mother, except maybe for a love charm, but for an actual uh, baby, not so much. So Ishtar is the erotic goddess who is free from maternity. In spite of this, from our earliest scholarship on Mesopotamian religion, Ishtar is understood as at least some kind of mother goddess. This comes across most clearly in Anton Daimel's 1914 Pantheon Babylonicum, wherein he identifies Ishtar as Ishtar, Dea Uleptatus Utbeli, and in his conclusion on the goddess, I don't know how to make this go away, okay. Um, Ishtar is deus, dea amoris, voluptatis et partus. So she is the goddess of love, of sexual pleasure, and in his final summation, partus, bringing forth childbirth. This aspect of her character appears nowhere else in his multiple page essay on the goddess and suggests that Fraser's fertility paradigm is influencing or infecting his work. Ishtar some Ishtar's ambivalent identity as a fertility goddess continues down through the 20th century often in works palpably influenced by Fraser's dying and rising god construct. So, for example, uh, for Samuel Noah Kramer in his 1963 book, I'm getting rid of that there, uh, The Sumerians, we read, the tutelary deity of Eric was Inanna, a goddess who throughout Sumerian history was deemed to be the deity primarily responsible for sexual love, fertility, and procreation. 
the king must become the husband of the life-giving goddess of love, that is, Inanna Eberic, if he was to ensure effectively the fecundity and prosperity of the land. Once again, we are reading Fraser here. In her joint publication with Kramer on Inanna, Queen of Heaven and Earth, Diane Wolkstein drank deeply at the well of Fraser in her construction of Sumerian religion. So Sumerian Demuzi is characterized as the force in the grain and the priestly lover and attendant of the fertility goddess Inanna. And farther down we read, the man who wed such a goddess would gain fertility for himself. The farmer who wed Inanna would gain fertility for his plants. The shepherd who wed Inanna would gain fertility for his land and people. Fertility, fertility, fertility. We continue in modern times to be influenced by this fertility paradigm. Rivka Harris, in her 1991 article on Inanna Ishtar as Paradox and Coincidence of Opposites, starts by informing us that Inanna, oops, Inanna uh, is more than simply the goddess of fertility, of love and war, and the morning and evening star, end quote. In Safati's 1998 book on love songs in Sumerian literature, we read how, quote, these songs describe and celebrate the love, courtship, and sacred marriage between the Sumerian love and fertility goddess Inanna and her husband, the shepherd god Dumuzi, biblical Tammuz. In his 1999 entry on Ishtar in the Dictionary of De Deities and Demons in the Bible, Tzvi Abush claims, her nature and behavior are characteristic of a type of early earth goddess who was both the source of fertility and life as well as the cause of death. She is the receiver of the dead and the mother of the living. She embodies the female principle, but with, as with all other primitive earth or mother goddesses, she did not need a male. In volume one of NIN, Journal of Gender Studies in Antiquity, Gebhardt Seltz writes in his Five Divine Ladies that, in earthly matters, Inanna's responsibility was to ensure the fertility of the land, something proved by her sacred marriage. In her 2007 article, Representing Abundance, Irene Winter tells us of the iconography of the Warka vase that the imagery seems especially appropriate to Warka and the goddess Inanna, whose powers govern fertility in the plant as well as the animal domain. And in 2013, Naomi Miller, writing on symbols of fertility and abundance in the Royal Cemetery of Orr, makes clear at the start that fertility and abundance are important themes of ancient Mesopotamian texts and images. The goddess Inanna and her consort Dumuzi personifies in the text of the second millennium BCE. In the end, our current obsession with Ishtar, the so-called fertility goddess, probably has a lot more to do with Wolkstein than the Victorians. But in many respects, this is because she was a conduit that reintroduced the ideology of Fraser into a modern and more popular age. Sigmund Freud and Feminine Passivity. One of the things that we no longer accept as true is that women are innately passive and masochistic, especially when it comes to sex. At least I really hope we currently think that way. This idea was a major implication of the work of Sigmund Freud in his studies of women and femininity, and one that was to have considerable effect in the mid 20th century, especially in the United States. In his lecture on specifically femininity, he states, the distinction is not a psychological one. When you say masculine, you usually mean active, and when you say feminine, you usually mean passive. Now, it is true that a relation of the kind exists. The male sex cell is actively mobile and searches out the female one, and the latter, the ovum, is immobile and waits passively. This behavior of the elementary sexual organisms is indeed a model for the conduit, conduct of sexual individuals during intercourse. The male pursues the female for the purpose of sexual union, seizes hold of her, and penetrates into her. The end result of the sexual passivity of women is the development of their masochistic tendencies, as the continuation of the species is dependent on the active sexuality of the male often without the consent of the female. Thus, we have called the motive force of sexual life the libido, 
sexual life is dominated by the polarity of masculine and feminine. There's only one libido, which serves both the masculine and the feminine sexual functions. To itself, we cannot assign any sex. If we, uh, if following the conventional equation of activity and masculinity, we are inclined to describe it as masculine. And below, to speak teleologically, Nature takes less careful account of its demands than in the case of masculinity. And the reason for this may lie, thinking again teleologically, in the fact that the accomplishment of the aim of biology has been entrusted to the aggressiveness of men and has been made to some extent independent of women's consent. While the idea of the sexual passivity of women was challenged and overturned in the 1960s, the more recent sexual revolution, the notion continues to influence how we interpret ancient texts. Although ancient Near Eastern mythology and literature consistently equate fertility with phallic masculinity and active eroticism with femininity, we continue to interpret both in terms of sexually active males and females as icons of, of course, fertility. Thank you, Fraser. An extreme example of this is the ongoing interpretation of the Sumerian tale of Enlil and Ninlil, which I'm not going to force you to read in its entirety, but basically the young goddess Ninlil is warned by her mother not to go bathing down by the river because if she goes to the river and strips naked, Enlil is going to see her, his eye bright, he will look at you, the shepherd who decides all destinies, his eye is bright, he will look at you. Straight away, he will want to have intercourse. He will want to kiss. He will be happy to pour lusty semen into the womb. And then Ninlil hears this, and she immediately goes right down to the river, strips naked, and starts bathing. And that's exactly what happens. He shows up in the world's first really savvy pickup line. He says, I want to have sex with you. She says no, she plays hard to get, if you will. My vagina is small, it does not know pregnancy. My lips are young, they do not know kissing. Enlil kind of goes off, he speaks to his friend asking, hey, do you know about this young chick, Ninlil? And I'd really like to have sex with her. And while all of this is happening, Ninlil stays right there by that stream, naked, and kind of waits for him to come back. And eventually they do have sex. Enlil gets in trouble for this, he runs away, and Ninlil chases after him. The text is very clear. Enlil went, Ninlil followed. Nun Amnir went, the maiden chased him. Three times over the course of the story, Enlil tries to disguise himself. Three times Ninlil has sex with Enlil in disguise and winds up pregnant with four babies at once. In the end, they marry and both deities are praised. The standard interpretation of this encounter is that Enlil raped Ninlil four times. For Gerald Cooper, the psychological portrait of Ninlil, who followed the man who raped her, yet had to be tricked into repeated acts of intercourse with him, is an early attestation of the well-known ambivalence of the victim, the, especially in sexual contexts. Even more recently for Philip Jones, the only old Babylonian myths with Enlil as their protagonist highlight the sexual tensions underlying his relationship with Ninlil. In both, Ninlil, in both Enlil and Ninlil and Enlil and Sud, agricultural prosperity is shown as ultimately following from the sexual abuse of Ninlil by her husband. This is most apparent in Enlil and Ninlil. Enlil rapes Ninlil, and then banished from Nippur for his crime, he thrice seduces her by deceit. So in all of this, we understand Enlil is having all the agency. But really, he seduced her? It might be better to reconsider the dynamics here in light of what we know about ancient Near Eastern constructs of sexuality and the female capacity for sexual activity. Ninlil seduced Enlil. Having been told that if she bathes by the river, he will want to have sex with her, she goes and bathes by the river. She plays hard to get. Uh, Enlil follows after the goddess and has sex with her, having grasped or taken hold of her. But no reference to violence is made. When he is banished, it's not necessarily for rape, but because he is so ritually impure, having sex outside of marriage. 
When Ninlil chases after Enlil, it is again assumed that she is seeking justice or that per Cooper, she's suffering from Stockholm syndrome. We never consider the possibility that she wants her man, that she is actively pursuing her man. And we do not think to congratulate her when she wins her man. The bath scene of seduction appears throughout the Near Eastern corpus. It's how Ninlil got her man. It's how Ereshkigal got her man. It's how Anatolian Shashka distracted her enemy, Hedamu, while in the female voice of the Cairo love songs, she invites her lover, my God, my lover, it is pleasant to go to the canal and to bathe in your presence. I shall let you see my perfection in a garment of royal linen, wet and clinging. <clears throat> Then I'll go into the water at your bidding, and I'll come out to you with a red fish who will be happy in my fingers. So come and look me over. But instead, we choose to interpret the tale of Enlil and Ninlil in the light of the story of David and Bathsheba, wherein a woman with no agency is raped and impregnated by a king. Freud's idea of the sexually passive, innately rapable woman continues to haunt our interpretations of Mesopotamian literature, where women and goddesses display considerable active enthusiasm for sex in the actual sources. Michel Foucault and Hierarchical Homosexuality. Michel Foucault, in his The Use of Pleasure, convinced academia that homosexuality between males is all about penetration and domination. Everything in the way of sexual behavior that might cause a free man to say nothing of someone who by birth and prestige held or should hold one of the first ranks among men to bear the marks of inferiority, submission to domination. And the acceptance of servitude could only be considered as shameful a shame that was even greater if he offered himself as the obliging object of another's pleasure. In short, it was parahusin against nature because it feminized one of the partners. That is a quote. Now, we cannot wholly blame Foucault for this. Much of his ideology on penetration and domination came from Kenneth Dover's 1978 book, Greek Homosexuality, wherein he concluded for the dynamics of pederasty in classical Athens that there seems little doubt that in Greek eyes, the male who breaks the rules of legitimate eros detaches himself from the ranks of male citizenry and classifies himself with women and foreigners. It is not only by assimilating himself to a woman in the sexual act that the submissive male rejects his role as a male citizen, but also by deliberately choosing to be the victim. And farther down, homosexual anal penetration is treated neither as an expression of love nor as a response to the stimulus of beauty, but as an aggressive act demonstrating the superiority of the active to the passive partner. The major development added by Foucault is that he generalized the sentiment to all of humanity's sexuality. So not just fifth century Athenians, but the ancient and presumably modern world in general. Thus he established a kind of code for ancient sexuality, both homosexual and heterosexual, predicated on nothing but power. Thus, we have to recall a principle which is doubtless not particular to Greek culture. And I am referring to the principle of isomorphism between sexual relations and social relations, always conceived in terms of the model act of penetration, assuming a polarity that is opposed, uh, that opposed activity and passivity and farther below. This suggests that in sexual behavior, there was one role that was intrinsically honorable and valorized without question. The one that consisted of being active, in dominating, in penetrating, in asserting one's superiority. This ideology first entered and dominated Greco-Roman classics, given its main promulgation by the scholar David Halperin in his 1990 book, 100 Years of Homosexuality. Thus, scholars sometimes describe the cultural formation underlying this apparent refusal by Greek males to discriminate categorically among sexual objects on the basis of anatomical sex as a bisexuality of penetration, 
or even more intriguingly, as a heterosexuality indifferent to its object. But I think it would be advisable not to speak of it as a sexuality at all, to describe it rather as a more generalized ethos of penetration and domination, a sociosexual discourse structured by the presence or absence of its central term, the phallus. Now, I would point out at this particular moment, we're currently seeing a backlash against this ideology in classical studies. Uh, the, the dominant work on that is Gregory Allen. 2001 PA's creation, forms of classical Athenian homosexuality in transhistorical, cross-cultural, biosocial, and demographic perspective, where he basically rips apart Dover and Halperin. Anyway, once male homosexuality came under scrutiny in ancient Near Eastern studies, the entire discourse became dominated by the who's on top question, and all approaches to the evidence for male eroticism in the A&E became a study of how male homoeroticism is problematic because of the way it creates unstable hierarchies amongst men by causing effeminacy and subdom dynamics. Thus, um, inexorable, almost geometric logic governs a Mesopotamian imagings of sex between male social equals. Any possibility of mutuality and eroticism instantly is collapsed into positionality and reinscribed with hierarchy and power. So that's for Mesopotamia, for the Hebrew Bible. We read, a sexual contact between two men mirrored the male and female roles. It was the former from the active partner's point of view, the latter from that of the passive partner. Thank you very much, Freud. Sexual contact between two men was prohibited because the passive party assumed the role of a woman and his manly honor was thus disgraced. And even speaking for Egypt, the only references to same gender sexual activities in the artifacts and non-literary texts of the Middle Kingdom present the act as one of denigrating the passive partner and a sign of the mastery of the active partner who does not step outside his gender role. It must be noted, though, that we have no data from the ancient Near East actually provides this. We have put it there. For just one example, to consider the omen text pertaining to male homosexuality from first millennium uh, Mesopotamia, the text of the Shoma Ala series, if a city, uh, four omens pertain to male homosexuality here. So, if a man penetrates his social peer via the buttocks, that man will become foremost among his brothers and colleagues. If a man penetrates an asinu, um, a cult functionary, hardships will be unleashed from him. If a man penetrates a girseku, a palatial functionary, for an entire year, the deprivations which beset him will be kept away. And then finally, if a man penetrates a houseborn slave, hardship will seize him. Four case studies of male-male homosexual intercourse. In three of these, where the man has sex with an equal, a cult functionary or a palace official, the end result is beneficial, becoming foremost of his peers or at least staving off bad luck for a while. It is only if a man has sex with a household slave that the result is negative. That is, in the one instance where there is actual balance of power and status between the two subjects. The one presumably with the higher status is the one who is punished. Analyses of these omens tend to follow the Foucauldian model, assuming that the first man, the Awilum, becomes foremost amongst his peers because he penetrated, dominated, and thus feminized a supposed equal. The second two omens are read in light of non-standard sexual identities for the Asinu and the Gerseku that the awilum is penetrating individuals who are third gender or the like. And Anne Guinan, who has done the most work on these omens, argues that the bad luck of the last omen derives from the fact that the performance of domination takes place in the private domestic sphere. The awilum cannot benefit from dominating his slave if no one knows or can see it. Instead, we might consider that it benefits a man to have sexual relations with other men of free status. The peer, the religious functionary, the palatial official. Perhaps male homosexuality was deemed socially beneficial in first millennia Mesopotamia. 
By contrast, one might suggest that sex with one not merely a social inferior, but one with no status or agency, a slave, is a form of rape, of what the Greeks would have called hubris. A man who commits hubris in his own household is not a good man. He's punished. Judith Butler and the performativity of sex. Now there's a lot to unpack here. Most commonly, Butler is associated with gender performance, the idea that femininity and masculinity only exist in external action. In other words, acts, gestures, and desire produce the effect of an internal core of substance, but produce this on the surface of the body through the play of signifying absences that suggest but never reveal the organizing principle of identity as a cause. Such acts, gestures, enactments generally construed are performative in the sense that the essence or identity that they otherwise purport to express are fabrications manufactured and sustained through corporeal signs and other discursive means. That the gendered body is performative suggests that it has no ontological status apart from various acts which constitute its reality. All fine and well. However, the, then she goes on to argue that the actual sexed body does not exist, but is a product of gender. Thus, if the immutable character of sex is contested, perhaps this construct called sex is as culturally constructed as gender. Indeed, perhaps it was always already gender, with the, consequent, the consequence that the distinction between sex and gender turns out to be no distinction at all. Indeed, sex by definition will be shown to have been gender all along. And she follows this up in 1993, Bodies That Matter, if gender is the social construction of sex, and if there is no access to this sex except by means of its construction, then it appears not only that sex is absorbed by gender, but that sex becomes something like a fiction. So there's no such thing as biological sex, only culturally constructed, performed gender. The effect of this has been a consensus, both in the academy and popular culture, that there's no such thing as binary biological sex merely performance. Furthermore, the idea of binary biological sex is nothing but a modern Western notion. That is, ancient people, and presumably non-Westerners, did not have any notion of male or female, man or woman. Thus, the new trend in figurine studies, where anything with breasts is still, of course, a fertility figurine, but of anything without breasts, well, let us assume that it is possible to sex individual figurines and figurine fragments. In doing so, we confront another assumption, that the concepts male and female were singular, unchanging, shared within and across communities. However, in light of what is now uncontroversial anthropological, sociological, and other social science research, the assumption that concepts such as male and female were static across time and space is unsupportable. And in a recent, admittedly self-published, but by actual academics, pamphlet on gender stereotypes in archaeology, one reads of the false stereotype binary sex and gender systems are natural, that, quote, the dominant heteronormative sex gender system binarizes human beings into men and women, tries to pass for natural, prescribes specific dichotomous self-ways, and proscribes what does not fall within them. Far from being natural, what is considered to be a man and a woman is a product of social and cultural processes. The present Western binary sex gender system is a product of history, and we cannot take it for granted. So how does all of this affect the study of the ancient Near East? Let us consider, if you will, the previously mentioned Mesopotamian cult functionary known as the Asinu and his rapport with the goddess Inanna Ishtar. This goddess is strongly associated with gender bending in a long literary tradition, whereby she turns men to women and presumably women into men, which, by the way, we never actually see. Thus, in the Sumerian poem attributed to the Entu priestess and Heduana, Inanna, lady of largest heart, we read, to turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man are yours, Inanna. 
dating back into Victorian times, male cult functionaries who were associated with her were deemed to be sexually suspect, generally identified as, quote, cultic performers, transvestites, homosexual prostitutes, catamites, castrati, hermaphrodites, and the like. By the late 20th century, they were less sexually suspect, so maybe not actually cultic prostitutes, but genderly suspect, being creatures of non-standard, non-binary gender. They were effeminate men, possibly castrates or intersex. They are identified as third gender males. For example, the Asinu mentioned previously in the Shuma Alu omens pertaining to homosexuality. In fact, his presence there assured modern scholars that he himself must be a passive homosexual, forgetting that also included in that omen list were royal officiants, household slaves, and regular guys. In reality, there are no clear data that indicate that the Asinu is anything other than a regular man in religious service. So to call up uh, one bit of evidence that is used in this debate, the hymn of King Idindagan A, this is summoned to argue that they must be transvestites. So if you look at the bottom, you read that they adorn their right side with male clothing. They walk before pure Inanna. They place female clothing on their left side and walk before pure Inanna. Uh, and what we have to realize is that it's not just the Asinus who are combing their hair at the top who are in this text. Between them and that fourth uh, Kirugu, we have a righteous man or even presented as the king in some versions of this hymn and the first lady, the woman of the great wise women. They also walk before pure Inanna. So what we do not stop and consider is maybe we just have both males and females in a long procession before Inanna, perhaps males to the right, females to the left, or a whole group of people who are wearing a kind of transvestite costume, not specifically associated with just one category of cult functionary. Coming down into the first millennium, oops. The most conclusive bit of evidence for a gender-bending aspect of the Asinu is the list Har Gud B, uh, line 133, wherein the scribe wrote, Ormunis equals Asinu, which equals Sinish, and then Sinish Anu, uh, basically restored. It's likely. Uh, the second word is also heavily restored. So this isn't really all that much to go on. And this is currently the best evidence we have for the gender bending of the Asinu. In other words, we have ridiculously little data. And if we are to go back to that notion of, well, isn't he associated with Ishtar and doesn't Ishtar turn men into women and women into men? Please understand in the fuller context of that hymn, Ishtar turns all opposites into opposites. Also in that quotation, she turns mountains into valleys and valleys into mountains. She turns floodplains into deserts and deserts into floodplains. She turns war into peace and peace into war. She turns males into females and females into males. This is the power of Ishtar. She has power over absolutely everything as expressed in binary opposites. So I would suggest rather than, okay, so rather in the field than reconsidering the non-binary third nature, uh, third gender nature of the Asinu, or that the evidence suggests that the residents of the A&E were in fact sexually binary in the first place, under Butlerian influence, we are instead now reconsidering our own personal tendencies to ascribe a binary sex to this functionary at all. The real confusion over his gender identity arises from an unshakable assumption across most of the secondary literature of a binary division between sex and gender. Of course, a distinction between cultural gender and biological self, sex is not in itself an unwarranted assumption and may indeed constitute a useful methodological precaution in many cases. But in the context of ancient Near Eastern non-binary identities, the dichotomy has been applied to the textual evidence in such a way that it has blurred some crucial distinctions. 
and below. If one considers the Asinus to be transgender, third gender, or gender ambiguous, one should use the appropriate pronouns. Or, as one recent presenter in the a and &E gender panel at the ASOR annual meeting put it, maybe the Asinu was simply assigned the wrong gender at birth. Rather than reevaluating the text to determine if the hypothesis of gender ambiguity is even actually there, we now subject the ancient Asinu to modern pronoun and identity politics. We have completely colonized the ancient world. So, looking forward, we're going to continue to do this because fads keep coming. Rapidly gaining ground in A&E studies are the works of Raywin Connell, whose work, by the way, I happen to love. I want to put that out there. Hegemonic masculinity is all the rage these days, so much so that we have not really stopped to ask ourselves whether a gender paradigm that was theorized for 21st century CE males in Australia may or may not pertain to 21st century BCE males in Uruk, Jerusalem, or Amarna. How does hegemonic masculinity work in a kingdom where your hegemonic male is automatically the king? How does hegemonic masculinity work in the Bet Ab when your hegemonic male is dad? Even so, all current studies of ancient masculinity are dominated by matters of hegemony. Thus, Several of the investigations confirm that the maintenance of patriarchal power was very much a preoccupation of the societies of Mesopotamia, Israel, Anatolia, and Persia. Yet, as this power was rooted in the proper for performance, thank you, Butler, of culturally defined and mutable hegemonic masculinities, it was tenuous. Or, much has been written about the meaning of Neo-Assyrian kingship to the Assyrians themselves, and Neo-Assyrian kingship relied on the construction and performance of ideal hegemonic masculinity for its exercise of rule. And we must consider the ancient Israelite construction of masculinity, focusing on what attributes are associated with hegemonic masculine ideal that permeated many biblical texts. We will then consider situations in which men are depicted as having their performance of hegemonic masculinity undermined. Obviously, McConnell's work has been heavily entangled with that of Butler's notions of gender performance. If we were to add Foucault into the mix, we would get a concluding line from a recent monograph on third gender in Mesopotamia. Another matter to be considered is the relation between third gender and homosexuality, especially the passive one. Does homosexuality produce effeminacy? Does it result from effeminacy? Is the receptive party effeminate? One thing can be said with certainty. The receptive party in homosexual relations did not conform to ancient Near Eastern features of hegemonic masculinity. So the next wave of fads and trans and buzzwords is clearly on its way. And thus, I would ask academics to stop for a moment and reconsider. The allure of buzzwords, fads, and trends is very strong. They get us published, they get us hired, they make us popular, but they also distort our understanding of reality. And once any idea is published, it continues to infect to the point that we no longer understand that it was once just a hypothesis, a fad, a trend. James Frazier continues to influence, for example. Even when hypotheses prove true, this need not be universally so, as once again, potentially the case with hegemonic masculinity. It takes some effort, but it is always good to reconsider our presuppositions and to resist the desire to inflict ourselves onto the past. Thank you.